Good morning. Uh, my name is Jordan Eister. I, uh, I'm trying to pick up a little bit where, where Dave Kiefer left off at Gettysburg College. We're with Disciple Makers, my wife Amanda and I. Been there for about two years. Um, we came in the spring of 2016. And as I arrived there, uh, they were finishing up a preaching series in the book of Genesis. And so uh, what, I, what I realized was the pattern of preaching there from what the team was doing was every fall, uh, they're in a gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And then in the spring, they'll just pick a different book of the Bible to go through, and they happen to be in Genesis. So the next fall, we were in a gospel, but spring 2017, I said to the team, I said, well, we'll never come back to Exodus unless we do it now on the heels of just hearing Genesis last spring. And the team was like, okay, Exodus is a little bit harder, but that's, that's fine. We, we understand that. Let's do it. Great. And so we did that. And then the next spring came along, 2018 here. You know what I said to the team? I used the same logic. I said, we'll never come back to the book of Numbers. I, I skipped Leviticus. That's just way too hard. But I said, we'll never come back to the book of Numbers unless we do it on the heels of hearing Exodus. And the team scratched their heads a little bit more and said, okay, I guess we'll do that. So we recently preached through Numbers on campus to college students every Friday night. It went really well. And so the, the sermon I want to bring to you today is from that series in the book of Numbers. And really the topic we'll look at this morning is the topic of trust. What comes to mind when I say the word trust? Trust. For those of you, for all of us, trust can be challenging. But for some of you, you're, you're easy trusting. Trust is, is somewhat easy. For others of you, trust is the hardest thing. And often it even seems impossible. A, a, a deeper question might be, how easy or hard is, is it for you to trust the Lord? When is it easy to trust the Lord? When does it almost seem impossible to trust the Lord? If you want to turn in your Bibles, I think that the number is there on your, on your, your bulletin and page number. But Numbers chapter 9, and we'll look a little bit of Numbers chapter 10. We'll look at trust in three ways. We'll look at the predicament of trust. We'll look at the paradox of trust. And then ultimately the person of trust. Numbers 9, 15 to 23 is kind of the section I'll read in chapter 9, 15 to 23. And then in chapter 10, verses 29 to 34. The word of the Lord, Numbers 9, 15. On the day that the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony. And at evening... It was over the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until morning. So it was always. The cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud lifted from over the tent, after that the people of Israel set out. In the place where the cloud settled down, there the people of Israel camped. At the command of the Lord, the people of Israel set out, and at the command of the Lord they camped. As long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. Even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle many days, the people of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was a few days over the tabernacle, and according to the command of the Lord, they remained in camp. Then according to the command of the Lord, they set out. And sometimes the cloud remained from evening until morning. And when the cloud lifted in the morning, they set out. Or if it continued for a day and a night, when the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether it was two days or a month, or a longer time, that the cloud continued over the tabernacle, abiding there, the people of Israel remained in camp and did not set out. But when it lifted, they set out. At the command of the Lord, they camped. At the command of the Lord, they set out. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by Moses. Turn, if you would, a page over to chapter 10, uh, verses 29 to 34 of chapter 10. And Moses said to Hobab, the son of Ruel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are setting out for a place which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us, and we will do good to you, for the Lord has promised good to Israel. But when he said to him, I will not go, I will depart to my own land and to my own kindred. And he said, please do not leave us, for you know where we should camp in the wilderness, and you will serve as eyes for us. And if you do go with us, whatever good the Lord will do to us, the same he will do to you. So they set out from the mount of the Lord three days' journey, and the ark of the covenant 
of the Lord went before them three days' journey to set out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was over them by day whenever they set out from the camp. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is breathed out, infallible, inspired by you, that it's profitable for us for teaching and reproof and correction and training in righteousness, that the man of God, the woman of God here today might be equipped for every good work. God, would you equip us this morning for the works you've ordained ahead of time for us to do. God, thank you that we are not saved by our works. We're saved to our works. God, that you have saved us by grace through faith, and you have things planned ahead for us to do. In your name we pray. Amen. That was way too redundant of a passage. I apologize again. I'm preaching in numbers. Difficult. Was it almost so redundant it was, it was hard to keep listening to? It's even difficult to keep reading at moments, right? Numbers can be difficult. The redundancy, I, I, I got a little frustrated at it the first time I read it, even the second time I read it. I almost had a critique in my mind. I, I wondered, Moses, couldn't you have written uh, this to, for, the, the, for us to clearly get the point in, in fewer words? Right? Don't, don't you feel that? When you read it, you say, couldn't he have written this in fewer words? He's really saying one thing over and over again, isn't he? What's he saying? He, in verse 18, might even sum it up. At the command of the Lord, the people set out. At the command of the Lord, they camped. Right? When the cloud lifts, the people set out. When the cloud stops, they camp. That, that's all he could have said. Moses, it could have been a much smaller paragraph. I almost get the feeling the book of Numbers could be even smaller if he just wrote things more succinctly. But I think there's... There, there's he has an aim in the redundancy. There, there, there's purpose to this. We have to look, take a, look, a deeper look at it. Look at the rep repetition of the word tent and cloud. Do you notice that? Tabernacle, the tent of the testimony, even the repetition of cloud. What's going on is that God is leading his people Israel, who have just been released from slavery from Egypt, and he's leading them to the promised land that he's going to give them. But between there and and where they're going, there's, there's a wilderness in between. And so God leads them through the wilderness. And why tent or tabernacle, the testimony shows up a lot in cloud, is that really this is one gigantic camping and hiking trip. He is leading millions of people through a trek through the wilderness, and they're going to camp along the way. You think taking teenagers maybe on a week of camping is something. Imagine millions of people, families, children, elderly, trekking through the wilderness, camping as they go. And so they're, they're erecting tents, and then they're taking them down and moving on. And so the tent of the testimony, the tabernacle, is really God's tent. God isn't just leading them on the trip. He, he's camping with them. The God of the Bible is among his people. He's camping alongside them. The reason the cloud shows up frequently in the passage uh, is that God chooses to represent himself as a cloud here. If they have to follow the Lord, they're going to have to have something visual to follow. But why a cloud? You might even take it for granted, right? Of course the Lord shows up as a cloud. It's, it's whimsical and mystical, and, and, and the Lord is spirit, right? So he doesn't have a body like ours, the Bible says. But why a cloud? Well, the wilderness is not a forest, like the wilderness might be in Pennsylvania here. The wilderness here is a desert. And deserts are dry because it does not rain. And since it doesn't rain, there are not clouds. And so if the Lord's going to obviously, clearly show who's leading them, it will be a cloud in the sky. It's unmistakable. It says that it's a, a cloud by day and fire by night. Commentators agree this, this isn't uh, something changing form necessarily as soon as the sun goes down. It's more of a volcano plume. Hawaii right now, even parts of Central America, even Indonesia, uh, have volcanoes erupting this past month. I saw a time-lapse video of these a picture of the volcanoes erupting, and they erupt for weeks at a time, right? They just keep going. By day, it looks just like a cloud coming out of the top of the mountain. But when the sun goes down, guess what it looks like? A pillar of fire. It, it's more of a, a volcano plume that's leading them through the wilderness than it is a cloud by day and fire by night. It looks like a cloud by day, but when the sun goes down, it shows the fire and the power that's inside that cloud. God is unmistakably, clearly uh, putting his signal in the sky to lead them through the wilderness. Look at the passage again, especially uh, chapter 9, that 15 to 23. I won't read it again. Uh, but what, what is predictable in the passage? 
What is predictable there in that passage? Do you notice it? There's a one-to-one correlation. You, you can count on it every time. What's predictable in the passage is the people's obedience to whenever the cloud moves. It's pre- every time. Do you guys notice it? There's not one deviation from it. What's predictable, what, what, what you can expect, is the people's response of obedience to the cloud, right? But what is unpredictable in this passage? What's unpredictable? God is, isn't he? We don't know when God will move or where he will take them. God is completely unpredictable in this story. Notice the timing words. Other than the timing words in this paragraph, everything is exactly the same over and over again. But what stands out as different in every, in every verse are the timing words. Notice them with me. Verse 15, at, at the end of there, at evening. At the end of 15, until morning. Verse 16, by day, by night. Verse 17, whenever. At the end of 18, as long as. Verse 19, many days. Verse 20 and 21, sometimes. 21, from evening until morning. 22, whether it was two days, a month, or a longer time. That Hebrew word there for a longer time is the same word for a season. Do any of those words describe, friends, what it's like for you to wait on the timing of God? Often, this is what life feels like. It's sometimes. It's, It's whenever. It's as long as. It's Life changes from daytime to nighttime. All of a sudden, it's 9 o'clock at night, and this day was completely different than you ever thought it would be. In the middle of the night, you get a phone call that the rest of your life has changed. Some of you are in a season right now where God seems too fast for you. God, God, you're moving ahead. I, I'm not courageous enough to go with you. God, I'm not ready for that. God, what are you doing? You're, you're moving on faster than I can handle right now. You're in a season where the cloud has moved, and you, how am I going to respond to where God is taking me? Or others of you are in a season where God seems too slow. God, I've been in this too long. It, it's been a decade. It's been, it's been a season of hardship. And God, I've been praying and waiting. And like the psalmist, you asked, how long, O Lord? But the cloud didn't move yet. You're camping out in a place you'd never thought you'd be for this long. And Israel, this is their journey. And friend, the Christian life, this is our journey too. It's whenever God moves, we want to move. But we don't know when or where he will move. What might all this mean? Friends, God is reliable, yet unpredictable. And so following his lead will require us to trust him. God is trustworthy, but make no mistake for him ever being predictable. And right, this is, this is not the kind of God that I want to read about in the Bible. I want to read about God who's good at heart and very predictable. But we don't get that one. We get a God who's good at heart and always unpredictable. Notice where he's leading the people. Uh, Chapter 10, 29, look at what Moses said. He's leading them to a land that he said, I will give it to you. A land of promise. That's the where he's leading them. Notice why he's leading them. His motives, in the next sentence, Moses says to this guy named Hobab, he says, come with us, we will do good to you, for the Lord has promised what? Good to us. His motives are good. But notice how he leads them. Whenever and wherever he pleases. He intentionally keeps his people on their toes. This combination of God being good at heart and unpredictable is the perfect recipe for trust. Let me explain. If God were good at heart and very predictable, there'd be no trust required. We'd always know what's coming. It actually would be very easy to manipulate God, to try to control him, treat him almost like a genie in a bottle at at our wish and command. In effect, we would be God of our life, if he were good at heart and very predictable. 
Take another one. And, and this is where we often, in, in, a, in a time, a season of, of trial, this is where we think God is, that he's, that he's unpredictable, and we question the motives. Of, he might be unpredictable, but what if he's evil at heart? What if he has my harm in mind? Well, trust isn't going to happen. We won't give him our trust. That would be terrifying if God were evil at heart and unpredictable. But friends, we get the only recipe for trust, and that's God is good at heart and unpredictable. It's the only recipe that we need to trust him. Each of you have many stories you're thinking of, you could share, where God has called you to trust him like you had never had to do before. Uh, for Amanda and I, it was moving and, and accepting the call of God to join disciple makers. I was on staff at a church for about seven years, um, noticing a tug on my heart to want to be on the front lines of mission, of evangelism, of seeing men and women meet Jesus and be changed by Jesus. And, and we had been on the receiving end of ministry uh, as college students from Disciple Makers at Kutztown University, where we met. And so we knew their ministry, we were excited about their ministry, and so I'm talking with Disciple Makers and also talking with the elders at my church about this switch. And I have the elders' approval, and, and uh, I have their... Their, their, just their heart and passion for me, and even as a supporting church. And so the next thing to do, though, is to announce to the, the people of our church, the 200 people in our congregation, that we're going to be hitting the mission field, and we're going to be leaving the church and, and raising support and being placed at a campus wherever the makers place places us. And uh, my wife was nine months pregnant at the time, and uh, just about maybe eight months. And so I'm realizing, all right, God, I, I've, I've, it's clear you, you are leading me this way, but I don't know how this is going to go. And so in April, I announced to the congregation, Amanda and I will be leaving staff here at the church and hitting the mission field with disciple makers. And so it was a bittersweet day. There were tears. People were sad to see us go. We had formed deep relationships and friendships there, and yet they were excited to see what God had in store for us. The, the staff at the church was just myself and the senior pastor. He's the only guy I worked with for these seven years. Um, Three weeks after I made that announcement, senior pastor was killed in a motorcycle accident. And so it's, it's the most surreal thing I've ever felt. Um, all of a sudden, the church feels like it's losing two pastors at once. I've got to prepare for a funeral, and I've never done this before because he always did it. I'm preparing for his funeral. And his funeral will be 800 people. And I've got to make calls to churches to ask them to donate chairs because we can't fit that many people in our sanctuary. I got to get an outside organization of media come in and wire up our rooms and put screens so that the people that come to this funeral can hear and see the funeral in different rooms of the church. I have no idea what God's doing in my life because I just made this announcement that I'm leaving. Does he want me to stay? The people of the church want me to stay. The elders are excited to see this call of God happen. For just, they've been talking with the elders about it for months and months. My wife's nine months pregnant. This is a moment I never saw coming. I never thought I'd walk down the aisle of the church like I'd always done every Sunday with my pastor. But this time, he's in a casket behind me. And that day was the most exhausting day of my life. I did a funeral for 800 people for my senior pastor. And I got home that night at 10 p.m., I'm wa Amanda's water breaks, and we go in the hospital and have our son. I'm in the hospital, and we're crying, and we're praying with nurses who had seen the story on TV and seen me in a little news interview, and like, it's just wildness. I lost a friend and a pastor and gained a son in the same day. And God had clearly, even actually in my life at the time, was using the book of Numbers to call me to the mission field. And it was exciting, and I want, I want to follow his lead, and yet it was unpredictable what would happen next. I never thought the story would be written that way, but God is good at heart, but he's completely unpredictable. What is it for you right now? What is it that you know God is leading you through? He, he's sovereign. He, everything is planned. There is no mistakes in God's plan, and yet it's not how you'd write the story. And it's unpredictable. You never saw it coming. You don't know how you'll get through it, but the one thing you can count on is that he's good at heart. He is promising good for you, not your harm. The point of the story is different than what we often hear or what we want to hear. Many biblical narratives portray uh, 
God's steadfast, reliable character in contrast to the unruly, unpredictable character of people, here it's the opposite. What's predictable is the people's obedience. What's unpredictable is God's behavior. The Bible gives us a true and good assurance, and you've read it often, and you can count on it. It's good. That God is with you wherever you go. It's good. But this prompts us with a different question. The question here is not uh, communicating that God is with you wherever you go. The question it, it challenges us with here is, are you with God wherever he goes? That's a different question. The one, that God is with you wherever you go, you might understand it over time that more like that you're the leader of your life and that God just kind of follows you. Rather, God is with you always, but as your leader. And the question is, are you with him wherever he goes? How does all this apply? Here's an application. Follow God's lead by trusting him enough to obey. Follow God's lead by trusting him enough to obey. Obedience is always a trust issue. Obedience is always a trust issue. You and I have circumstances every day where we're challenged to either obey or disobey. And guess, guess which one we choose? You choose whichever one you trust most. Whenever you obey God, you are trusting that obeying God is the path for your good. Same thing with disobedience. You're trusting. When you disobey, you are trusting that disobeying God is the path for your good. The next time you run into trial or temptation, realize this is a moment of which one you will trust. Will you trust that obeying God is the path of your good, or will you trust that disobeying God is the path of your good? You could flip it and say every, every circumstance is a path of distrust. When you obey, you are distrusting the lie that sin is the path of your good. And when you disobey, you are distrusting God that obedience is for your good. Look at the paradox of trust. Look at the paradox of trust. Look again at chapter 10, that portion there that we read, 29 to 34. When I, when I caught this the first time, it was so odd to me. I, I, I really... I. I contemplated it long and hard. I didn't understand it at first. And it's not just that the word Hobab appears. That's a strange name, isn't it? Hobab. We were, we were on staff at a church where we were in youth ministry. And as Amanda was uh, pregnant, uh, the youth were coming up with names that we should name our baby. Yeah, this is always a good one. And, and they, came, they found Hobab, and they really wanted us to name our baby. Girl or boy? Uh, Hobab. We didn't do it. Um, I don't know what it is about youth and young adults and wanting to come up with names for you to name your, your baby, but the, the students at Gettysburg did it too, where our, our third child is where we were here at Gettysburg, and we already had a, a Zoe and a Samuel, and now we're pregnant with baby number three, and the students came up with that, what we, should, we said, well, what, we should name, what should we name our, our third child? Not really asking for them to pick the name, but just asking, right? And uh, they said we should name our third child Samuel as well. So that we could have first and second Samuel. <laughs> Again, we didn't do it. Um, but Hobab is a strange name. It's okay to laugh. I'm sure he was laughed at. But the, what, what's stranger is the dialogue uh, between Moses and Hobab. Do you notice the dialogue? It, it's, it's a paradox here. Moses asks uh, Hobab, will you join us on our journey we want you to serve as eyes for us in the wilderness. Do you see that? He's, in effect, asking Hobab to lead them through the wilderness. Now, this is so strange. What had God just got done saying? Redundantly so. God is their leader. He will lead them through the wilderness. What is this where Moses is now asking this guy named Hobab to lead them? What's going on? Is this a paradox? How is this solved? Why confuse the leadership of God with this guy named Hobab? Are they to follow the cloud, or are they to follow Hobab through the wilderness? The answer is yes. Following God's lead is always mediated through helpful people. Following God's lead in your life is always mediated through helpful people. Israel doesn't just need a God in the sky, they need a guide on the ground. And this is actually very practical. As God is leading them through a dangerous terrain, 
if they have all of their heads looking up to the cloud in the sky, they'll fall off a cliff. They'll, they won't be able to wade through the rivers. They won't understand the, the crags and the mountains and, and how, how to find water in, in a desert. They need to follow the cloud, but they need a guide on the ground to help them navigate the path. Does that make sense? This is not contradictory, because Hobab wouldn't trek his own course. Hobab would follow the cloud. And so they have a god, a god in the sky, and a guide on the ground. How does this apply? Friends, trust God enough to trust human leaders in your life to help you and to give you the wisdom to navigate the tough landscape of life. There's a few ways we can get this wrong in life, and there's two types of people here. Uh, I, I fluctuate between the two of them. I, I've, met, I've met both of these kinds of, which one are you, is the question. But some of you are the kind of person that you love to get your quiet time in the morning, it's just you and God. You love the idea of seeking God's will for your life. For you, it's a solo sport. It's you in your prayer closet with your ESV Bible and the prayer journal, and you're in there for two hours, and you delight to spend time just you and God, and you don't need anyone else. You almost see it as unspiritual or competing with God's guidance to ask another person for help, another person for wisdom or guidance or leadership from anyone around you from the community of faith, and really, your head is in the clouds. God does not intend you follow him forsaking the human guides that would help you to follow him. Again, Hobab is not picking a different direction than the cloud. Hobab is helping the people actually know what it is to obey the direction of God in their life, right? How many of you have mentors, leaders, brothers and sisters tangibly in your life to help you and guide you to what it is to follow the direction and the command of God in your life. The other kind of person has a converse problem. You've got lots of how-to books. You have dozens of mentors, pastors, elders, blogs. You read podcasts. You listen to uh, teachers, scout leaders, you name it. You have all the help you could find. But maybe you fail to know God deeply. Maybe you fail to understand him accurately. Maybe you fail to have intimacy with him, and you don't know the sound of his voice, the Bible. You can have all the helpful people around you, but if you fail to look up and see God's direction in your life, he won't make your path straight. Friends, we need to walk with God like Moses here, looking up in faith and obedience while looking outward for practical wisdom and help from the community of faith around us. Again, it's not the contradiction. If the cloud goes one day and Hobab goes another way, follow the cloud. But wise human guides are merely to help us trust the Lord. Think of the one and others in Scripture. These are the commands that we're talking about. The commands were easy for the people, uh, easier for the people in, in the wilderness right now. It's kind of like following a GPS, right? In one mile, take a left. In 500 feet, veer to the right. right? The, the, these are the directions, these are the commands they're following. You wish life was this simple, what it means to obey the Lord or, or follow his lead in your life. Take a right, take a left. But these, life is a thousand times more complicated but yet, don't pursue God's will for your life in the mystery of the things you could never know. The who's, the what's, the where's, the when's. I hear this from college students all the time. The first place they go in understanding what is God's will for my life, what they mean is, who am I going to marry? Where am I going to go to grad school? What internship am I going to get over the summer? They're asking really the mysterious unknown things they couldn't know anyway. To the, actually to the neglect of the primary ways we can know God's will for our life, the clear black and white commands of Scripture. Serve one another. Love one another. Encourage one another. Pray for one another. Bear one another's burdens. Forgive one another. Love your enemies. These are the c clear commands and directions. If we follow them and trust in obedience, we are following God's will for our life. Look, lastly, this morning at the person of trust, the person of trust. All scripture, it points us to Jesus. Question for you, is Jesus more like the cloud in the sky, or is Jesus more like Hobab on the ground? Jesus asks you to follow him, right? That's what he says in the Gospels over and over again, follow me. 
Is following Jesus more like following the cloud in the sky, or is following Jesus more like following Hobab on the ground? Again, the answer is yes. In Jesus, God in the sky became our guide on the ground. John 1.1 1, 1 and 1.14 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us. God in Jesus camps among us, lives like one of us. The God in the sky became our guide on the ground. In Numbers, God was represented as a cloud, a nameless, faceless, amorphous mist. That's how God represented himself. In Jesus, God now has a name and a face. There is no mist. There is no haze. There is no confusion. There is no more mystery. God can't be more clearer than he is to you in Jesus. He has a name and a face. While Hobab was a native of the wilderness, meaning he grew up there, he perfectly knew the terrain like the back of his hand, in Jesus, God becomes a native of humanity, perfectly navigating the landscape of life's trials and tests and temptations and sufferings, and he did it for you. Whatever you're going through this morning, whatever kind of predicament you're in that you need to trust God, Jesus knows the feeling. He's been there. He asks you to follow him because he, he's lived life ahead of you and before you and asks you to follow in his footsteps. And this life led him to a cross, a cross of abandonment and isolation. And friend, please hear this. Christ endured a cross of abandonment and isolation so that all of you who trust him will never be left without a leader. You are not in it alone. He's been there for you in your place, and I don't know what you're going through. The phrase is said too often, I know what you're going through, I don't. Jesus does, and he's for you, and he's with you, and he's guiding you with good motives. As a parent, uh, there's, there's songs now that you hear that you want to sing to your kids and sing to your kids, and it, it jogs my memory of the things I heard and things my mom and dad sung to me when I was a kid. And it's weird now that, that this is, I can't believe I'm, I'm a parent of three kids, um, but these songs are starting to come back to me, and it's been, it's been over a decade or more since I've heard this song, and I, I've heard it again. I won't sing it for you. You're welcome. Um, but the lyrics of this song is what I'll end with, and, and really, it's, it's, the, it's the soundtrack for this passage. And, and It's a familiar song. You probably know it. Trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. There is no other path of good that you could be on other than the path of trusting and obeying. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for sending Jesus for us. Thank you for helping us navigate what's tough about life because we can follow Jesus. Trust Jesus. God, thank you for being unpredictable, uh, that you want to keep us trusting, keep us looking to you and not to ourselves, but God, more so, thank you for being good faithful, reliable, that in the midst of the uncertainty and the trusting, we can stand on the firm fact that you are good. Thank you, God. In your name we pray. Amen.